That was the beginning of the, of the epistle. Now let's go to the end of it, 1 Peter chapter 5. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, he tells them the things that are necessary in order to, in order to properly go through whether, what not only they are facing right now, but what they're about to, to continue to face uh, by, by the greatness of the fire and the tribulation that's coming. And if you look with me in verses, uh, chapter 5, verses 5 through 11, verse 5 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we ask your blessings upon this time in your word, and we pray that you would speak to our hearts. I believe that we are living in a different, more different times than we've ever lived in in our lives, and, and uh, things are are happening around us so quickly. It seems like society is degenerating and it seems like uh, good is being evil spoken of and evil is being well spoken of. Uh, values uh, and morals have just been tipped upside down. And Lord, we're, we're right smack dab in the middle of all that. And Father, if, if we think for five seconds that it's not going to affect us, we're extremely deluded. It's going to affect us. It's going to affect us in many different ways. And it is so important that we have the right attitudes, that we have the right perspective uh, toward you uh, during these times. And we pray, God, that you would give us wisdom from above. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would help us to get an understanding not only of the times we live in, but what is necessary for us in order to respond properly and, 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 and through it all, have that joy and have that peace that passes all understanding. We pray, Father, that you would guide and direct and bless this message this morning. As the word of God goes out, may the Holy Spirit of God be able to speak to us just like, like we sang in the last song, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The name of this message is uh, How to Navigate Through Difficult Times. And um, it's, a, it's a two part message. I'm doing one of the points this morning, two of them tonight. So you have to come back tonight to get the rest of the message. But uh, just like the, the people that that the Apostle Peter was speaking to, that we're going through difficult times and about to go through more difficult times. I believe we're living in a day and age when things are, are not, you know, if, if you've if you got your eyes open and you see where things are today and what road we are going down as a nation, and not just as a nation, but really the entire world, uh, things are about... To, to get interesting, and they've been pretty interesting the last couple of years. I believe that it's going to continue in, in that direction. And, uh, you know, you can't hardly go anywhere today without hearing people talk about gas prices, talk about the economy, uh, talk about corruption and government, and on and on and on it goes. Uh, and all those things are true, but and again, to think that it's not going to affect you personally, you're, you're living in a dream world. It is going to affect you personally. And I think it, in many ways it already has. Well, what is so important during these times, and by the way, uh, what's going to happen, one of the things, and you're seeing it already, 
uh, with the calling of good evil and evil good, uh, the things that you and I stand for, the biblical values that we stand for are going to be attacked. And when they are attacked, we will be attacked. And it is so important that we arm ourselves with the right spirit and the right attitude and we walk into this thing uh, with, with a proper perspective so that uh, just as it's stated throughout the book of the, the book of, of First Peter, um, so that that uh, uh, we uh, have the right attitude all all the way down the line. Our 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 verse of the month. I thought this was interesting. Our passage of the month is First Peter chapter three, verses thirteen through sixteen, and. Uh, uh, in verse 13, it says, and who is he that will harm you? And again, these folks were being harmed. They were, they were being persecuted. If ye be followers of that which is good. In other words, in other words uh, yeah, they might be able to hurt you outwardly, but if you're following that which is good, God's going to watch over you. And in verse 14, it says, but and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Now, let me ask you a question. And I don't know if you've ever done this before, but I've read that, that passage over and over and over again. And there have been some times, because of something that's been going on in my life at that particular time, where I got to verse 14. I'm just being honest with you, okay? And it says, But if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And on the inside I've said, Yeah, right, sure. <laughs> I'm just overjoyed. You know why that is? Because my spirit's not right. Because I'm not prepared for what was happening in my life, and I wasn't handling it properly. The Bible's never wrong. And all God's people said, <laughs> okay, Bible's never wrong. If it says, listen, you can be happy during those times, then you can be happy during those times. Your happiness as a Christian as a saved person, is not dependent on outward circumstances. It's dependent upon God in your heart and, and what he's doing in your life. And so we're going to be taking a look at, uh, both this morning and, and tonight, three different things that are absolutely necessary uh, in order to, to, to have in our lives so that we can navigate through difficult times. We're going to look at the first one this morning, and that's verses 5 through 7. Let's read it again. It says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with hum humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. First thing that's absolutely necessary is, is to be humble, to have humility. Humility, according to the scripture, brings grace. And grace is just simply power from God. It's, it's a desire and ability to do God's will. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a favorable influence of God upon your life. Uh, it, it's, it, it, grace renews the heart and it causes us to restrain from sin and gives us the power to be able to resist sin. Pride, pride on the other hand, brings resistance from God. The Bible says uh, uh, God resisteth the proud. Uh, listen, when, when you're going through difficulty and you're going through uh, hard circumstances, the last thing you want to be is proud. You want to be humble during that time. Why? Because you don't need more resistance and you certainly don't need it from God. Uh, as, we, as we go through some difficult and, tr and troublesome times, I believe, that's on the horizon for our country and for us as individuals, I, I think it's, it is it's so important for us to maintain a humble spirit. We, we, want, <laughs> we want God to be for us not against us. We want God to be helping us and assisting us, not resisting us. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31 says, if God be for us, who can be against us? And that's, that really is true. Uh, you and God, you, know, you may have heard this before, but you and God always make a majority. And so, so if God be for us, who can be against us? But conversely, the reverse is also true. If God be against us, it doesn't make any difference who's for us. 
You don't want to have God resisting you, and particularly during difficult times. There's, there's two primary ways that uh, pride manifests itself in our lives, and we find it in verses 5 and 7. Verse 5, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another. And, and uh, that's very similar to a verse we find over in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, says be, be, uh, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. We're told to, to have a humble spirit and a submissive spirit toward each other on a continual basis. Down in verse 7, it says, it says uh, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. One of the things that's interesting and, and I think very essential in understanding the Bible is that when you're reading down through Scripture, pay attention. Pay attention to the punctuation marks. Because where he talks about in verse 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that ye may exalt yourself in due time, it, it doesn't stop there. There's, a, there's a, a colon there, and then, then it goes on, and is, it says, casting all your care upon, uh, upon him, for he careth for you. In other words, the whole thing is, is connected. And there's, there's two ways that we find that pride has a way of getting into our lives. Number one is through lack of submission to authority. Now, it starts with God's authority directly. Uh, God gives us commands. He expects us to obey them. And when we don't, we, we disobey his authority. But there's not only God's di direct authority, but there's also God's indirect authority. And God's indirect authority is when he puts people in our lives that are authorities over us. And God does that all the time. You find that in Scripture. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, back up with me just a little bit and go, in verse, go to verses 18 through 20. He's talking to servants, people that are, are working under human authorities. And in verse 18, he says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it? If when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. What he's, what he's talking about there is, is uh, people that were, that were servants. They served under others. It would be similar to an employer-employee relationship that we have today. And, and uh, he said, listen, be subject to all of them, but not just the good ones. Be subject to, in other words, respectful to, and act properly to the froward. Now, if you don't know what froward means, take your Bible concordance and, and look up the word froward just in one book. That's all you have to do. Just look up the word froward in the book of Proverbs. Froward is a nasty person. Uh, froward is a person who it's my way or the highway. A uh, froward person is one that seeth no good. All he sees is problems all the time. All he sees is difficulties all the time. And uh, the Bible says that even the froward ones were supposed to be, if they're in authority over us, we're supposed to have the right kind of, of attitude toward them. Romans chapter 13, uh, verses 1 and 2 says, Let every soul be subject under the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance thereof. I found that, that uh, a lot can be said, a lot can be learned about a person's relationship with God with how they respond to the human authorities that God has placed over them. And what that takes is a humble spirit is a spirit that swallows its own pride and does what it's told to do. A second way that, that pride uh, kind of slips in it is found, and this is, this is a little bit more subtle, but again, it's connected with that, that whole admonition to being humble. In verse 7, it says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. 
One of the ways that pride shows up and manifests itself is by us taking matters into our own hands and thinking that we have all the answers. You know, the older I get, the less answers I think I have. And uh, it used to be when I was younger, I thought I had a whole bunch of answers. And now I'm, I, I, as, I, as I'm older and have more experience and really have more knowledge than what I had back in my 20s, I really, I, I really wonder if I've got as many answers as I thought I had you know, back then. Uh, but when, w when we take matters into our own hands, uh, that's when we get into trouble, and that's, that's when pride is obviously manifesting itself in our lives. Uh, we, we do that when God tells us to do something or not to do something, and we simply tell God no. We, we, we you know, uh, say, well, my circumstances are different. We can rationalize ourselves, it seems like, out of just about anything but the bottom line is if we're, if we're not doing what God wants us to do or doing something that God does not want us to do, we're defying his commands. And another way that we, we do that is by uh, taking matters into our own hands is by doubting God's care and doubting whether or not God can really take care of us during difficult times. Um, you know, one of the things you hear the most about and, and, and we've heard a lot of it here recently. But in fact, there's hardly a time I can turn on the radio and listen to the news and not hear about rising gas prices, you know? And, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's true. It does put some pressure on. There's no doubt about it. Gas prices are more than double right now what they were a couple of years ago. But is God sufficient? Well, the, the answer to that is yes. And the, the, the more we gripe and complain about those things, the, the more it sounds like we're saying that God can't take care of us. And of course, you know better than that. I, I've talked to, within the last few weeks, I've talked to evangelists and missionaries that are on the road, you know, and this thing has really hit them, hit them hard and hit them fast. But you know what every, every one of them has said in one form or another? They said, but, but God takes care of us. You know, that's really the bottom line. And that's the, that's the humble attitude we need to come to God with is that, listen, Lord, I don't need to take it into my own hands. You can take it, take it into, into your hands, casting all our care upon him, for he careth for you. And he does care for us, and he is going to take care of us if we just simply let him. And then another way that we, we take matters into our own hands is by, and show our pride is by getting impatient with God. And uh, uh, we, we don't see things being done either the way we like them to be done, the way we thought it should have been done, or, or in the time frame. You know what I found? I, I've, and I found this over the years. You can implicitly trust God for everything, not just the salvation of your soul, which is obviously the most important thing, trusting him to save you and to give you eternal life. Uh, you can do that, but you can also trust him for every single aspect of your life. And the moment we, we think that we can control it or we can handle things better than God can, then that's when we have problems. And that's why he tells us at the end of that whole thought on humility. He says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. There's, there's some things that, that humility does for us. Uh, as you look in verses 5 and 6, there are three things that the Bible says are, are advantages of being humble. Number one, it causes God to give us grace. And by the way, you need lots of grace. And I need lots of grace. And all God's people said, and we do. We just need a lot of grace. And as we're, we're going through what I believe is going to be some, some difficult and, and stringent times, uh, I, I, I believe more than ever before we need the grace of God. The Bible says, God giveth grace to the humble. The more humble we are before our God and before others, not just God, but before others, the more humble we are, the more grace he gives us. And the second thing that it does is it says that, it, that he will, if we're humble, he'll exalt us in due time. It allow, allows God to exalt us. 
Now, now he won't exalt us at the, uh, at the expense of humility. In other words, in order to exalt us, he's got to take us through some humbling times. And by the way, that's part of the reason for the trouble. That's part of the reason for the difficulty. Uh, God allows us to go through the trouble and allows us to go through the difficulty because he knows that we have a constant battle on our hands. And the constant battle is pride. Uh, you, you look at, at that whole scenario about pride, and it was actually the first sin that ever entered God's universe. And when we think of the first sin, we think of oftentimes the first sin of mankind, which was when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and took of the fruit of the knowledge of, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But that wasn't the first time that, that sin came into the universe. Sin came into God's universe when Satan said five different times, Lucifer at the time, he said, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Five times he said, told God what he was going to do. And what that simply was was pride. Well, just as that began the, the downward fall, obviously for Satan, uh, and, and got passed on to us, and, and of course he, he tempted Eve with, with some prideful thoughts, pride has always been a continual battle in our lives. And he won't exalt us at the expense of humility. Uh, in other words, he's got to put us through some humbling times in order to, to uh, bring us to the point where we're humble before him and then he can give us grace. Uh, you need grace more than you need relief from your problem. You need grace more than you need a break. You need grace more than you need visible victory. You need grace more than you need financial security. The truth of the matter is the greatest commodity in this universe is God's grace. And we are in desperate need of the grace of God. God giveth grace unto the humble. Period. There's no other way you can get it. You have to be humble before God. And you think about this. If, if you have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, if you're sitting there this morning and you know for sure that your sins are forgiven, and that you're on your way to heaven. How do you know that for sure? Well, you came to God and you said, Lord, I'm a sinner. You know what that takes? That takes humility. You said, I'm a sinner. Uh, I've done wrong. And not only have I done wrong, but I deserve something for my sin. Because of my sin, I deserve and am heading for hell for all eternity. I deserve to burn forever for what I have done against you. Those two things absolutely take humility. They take a humbling of ourselves. Third thing you have to be willing to admit, that you had to be willing to admit, was that you were, you were lost and you needed a savior and you could do nothing. That's probably the biggest hurdle that people have to get over in order to trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. is just to realize there's nothing you can do. He did it all. If, 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 uh, if there was anything you could have done, why would Jesus Christ leave heaven, take on human flesh, and then die such a gruesome, horrible death on Calvary's cross and then be raised again the third day? Uh, there's nothing you can do, and that's why he came down, and that's why he died that death for you and, and for me, because there was nothing, absolutely nothing that we could do. And it takes humility to admit that I can do nothing. It's not of works which we have done, but according to his mercy that he saved us. Uh, for by grace he saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What's boasting? It's pride. And so that pride has to be swallowed, that humility, that humble spirit has to be taken. And we need to come to God and just say, listen, I can't do this. You have to do it all or it won't be done. You have to forgive me of all my sin or my sin can't possibly be forgiven. And then we just simply need to ask him to save us, um, believing that when we cry out to him for mercy, that he'll do it. You know what all those things do? They take humility. 
It, all of those things require humility. So, so uh, humility is an absolute necessity in our lives. Uh, the, the, the third thing that humility does, it not only causes God to give us grace and allows God to exalt us in due, in due time, but the, the Bible says it clothes us. It's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting verse. Look down in verse, uh, in verse 5. It says, Likewise, ye younger, be, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. It says clothed in humility. Humility clothes us. To clothe, to clothe means to cover with dress for concealing nakedness and defending the body from cold or injuries. So it, it does two things. Clothing conceals and, and, and clothing also protects. It conceals private things. You know what? You know one of the things humility does? It hides a lot of other flaws. The more humble you are, the less people see the other problems in your life that you have. Because, because humility is like a clothing. And secondly, it protects. And it protects us from hurtful things. Pride leaves you naked. It leaves you vulnerable uh, to, to, to danger and to sin. Why did, why did Eve partake of the fruit of the knowledge of, of uh, good and evil? Because pride got a hold of her. And, and Satan said, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. She said, oh, I want that. Man, I want to be like God. Well, that was pride that grabbed a hold of her heart. And that pride brought sin and brought her into danger. Uh, did, you, did you ever... Did you ever get angry in public and say things that you wish you had never said? And, and afterwards, you, you either said or you thought to yourself, man, I never wanted them to see me in that kind of a, of a condition. Well, you know what? When you're proud, you don't do that kind of stuff. When you're proud, you don't fly off the handle. Uh, when you are, excuse me, when you're humble, when you're humble, you don't fly off the handle. When you're proud, you do. And, and uh, so what that humility does is that it protects us and it protects us from the, the wrong attitudes that we could easily develop. How, how is humility seen? Well, humility is seen through, first of all, through submission, according to the passage that we read being subject one to another, having, a, having a, an attitude of esteeming others better than ourselves. The moment we think we're better than somebody else, you've got a pride problem. I've got a pride problem. And, and we, we need to, to, to have a, a submissive attitude toward others. An another way that humility is seen is by trusting God for his timing in all things. Uh, just realizing that God is going to take care of us. And if we do right and if we live for him and if we have a humble spirit, he'll make sure we're taken care of. And then thirdly is by giving all our care to, to, to God, casting all our care upon him for he careth for you. You know, ab above all that, that tells other people that we believe that God loves us and that God takes care of us and that we are under his care. When we worry and when we fret, what we're saying is, is that God is irresponsible. What we're saying is, is that God doesn't care. What we're saying is, is that God can't be completely trusted. He can only be trusted in some areas, but possibly not in others. And so, so pride can really destroy our testimony and a, and a a humble spirit is, is something that's absolutely essential for going through difficult times. How does God show his love and, and care for us when we cast all our care upon him? I, I love that verse, verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You know, it makes us realize that we can't, we're not sufficient in and of ourselves. And we desperately need God. We not only need him for salvation, but we need him every moment of every day. We have a song that we sing around here that says, uh, I need thee every hour 
It's true. There's not an hour that goes by that we don't desperately need God. And a humble spirit realizes that. How does, how does God show his love and care for us when we cast all our care upon him? Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And that just simply tells us he gives us the courage and he gives us the strength to stand against our fears and to stand against our cares. He's there to do that and he wants to do that and he wants to give us that strength. Uh, another way that he, he shows his love and care for us when we cast all our care upon him. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. They giveth all, to all men liberally and upbraideth not. But again, you won't do that if you're proud. You'll do that if you're humble. When you realize that, listen, I don't have all the answers. And right now I need some wisdom. And I, know how, I need to know how to properly respond to the situation that I'm in right now. And the only way I can get that wisdom is get it from God. A third, third way that he shows his love and care for us is uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. I love this verse. It says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And God's just simply saying that those things that strengthen you, you can do those things, but you can't do them in your own power. You can't do them in your own strength. You can only do them in the power and the strength of God. And he'll give you the strength to do what you need to do. If, if, if uh, there is something that he has asked you to do, he will give you the strength, the power, and the resources, and all of the grace in order to get that thing accomplished. And then the last way that he shows his love and care toward us is uh, stated in Psalm 37, verse 5. It says, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. If we commit our, 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 our ways to him, our problems, our difficulties, our, our situations, the Bible says that, that he'll bring those things to pass and he'll guide and direct us. Take your Bibles and in closing this morning, look with me in Psalm 55. Psalm 55. Psalm 55, look down in verse 22. It says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. But you know what that takes? That takes humility. If we have a proud spirit, he'll step back, and he'll let us do things our own way. He'll let us take matters into our own hands. And that never, at least for me, and I'm sure for you, it never, ever ends well. Instead, we ought to humble ourselves before God and cast all our care upon him, for he cares for us. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads bowed and eyes closed just before we pray. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever humbled yourself before God for the purpose of salvation? Have you ever come to God realizing you're a sinner and on your way to hell and the only way you can go to heaven is by trusting him and him is alone as your savior? You asked him for mercy, he saved you. He forgave you all your sins and gave you eternal life. You know that for sure because of what the Bible says and what God did for you personally. I wonder if you'd just raise your hand as a testimony of that fact. Say, Pastor, here's my hand. I know for sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven because I've trusted him as Savior. All right, thank you. You can put your hands down. How many of you would be just as honest and say, I don't know that for sure. You know, I don't know that I've ever humbled myself like that before God and told him he was the only way and that I was a sinner and I am going to hell. But I need him as my savior and I know it. Would you please pray for me? Is there anyone like that here this morning? Just by an uplifted hand. And I won't point you out. I wouldn't embarrass you for the world. But I'll acknowledge the fact your hand is up. And I'll pray for you. 
All right, you're here this morning and you're saved. Can I tell you, I know what one of your biggest problems is, is in life. I, I, I just do. You say, well, how do you know? Because it's mine too. It's a problem of pride. And that's why over and over again in Scripture, the Bible says, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. God deals with all of us differently, takes us through different things. One of the reasons why, if you're going through a difficult time right now, personally, it's because there's a need in your life. And God's working on that humility. He constantly wants to keep us humble because he constantly wants to give us grace and he constantly wants us to cast our every care upon him because he cares for us. Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts this morning. Show to us the areas where there's pride. Show to us the areas where we've not humbled ourselves. Maybe it's with someone in our family. Maybe we need to humble ourselves before someone at work. Maybe we need to humble ourselves with a friend or another relative. Or most importantly, maybe there's an area in which we've not humbled ourselves before you. God, I pray that you would work in our hearts this morning. And if there's anyone here within the sound of my voice that has not trusted Jesus Christ personally as their savior. They don't know for sure if they died today, they go to heaven. They're not absolutely positive that their sins are forgiven because you've given them redemption. Father, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. Please, please do a work in our hearts that only you can do by your spirit and by your word. And we'll be careful to thank you and praise you for what you do in Jesus name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Let's stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. The music is going to play softly, and as it does, if there's something you need to take care of, the altar's open.